out of it. Let me enter in view full screen mode first, make it a little bit smaller. Sorry, can you tell me if you actually see the header in the bottom of the slide? Can you? Yes. 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 Excellent. Okay, so, um, right, so good afternoon everyone so i have a lot of slides to go through but you have the link i'll try to cover as much as i could in terms of the different things that you need to be aware of obviously you know i'm not going to go in depth in each of them and this is why you know we are really happy to help you and follow up on specifics that you want to go in in more depth at a later stage um, i also don't see the chat so i don't see the question asked but i will stop uh, frequently and I actually you know encourage you to actually ask me questions you can write them down and somebody can read or you actually you can um, address them yourself right okay so here is the outline my intent is to first of all give a definition of the interoperability standard and you actually will see that I'm not using the word metadata simply because at times there's a long discussion of what is metadata what is data and etc but hopefully it will be clearer regardless. So I'll introduce what the interoperability standards are. Uh, I intend to cover especially um, what the type of organization that are out there which are developing standards. You will see they are very different and there are many obviously. I will try to use as many examples as I can throughout, especially example where I've been. So you know it's first-hand experience uh, and obviously lesson learned and I apologize in advance if my example will be in the life science because this is or the groups I've been part of I've been contributed to many standards in the life sciences and then I will go and explain but whatever I say the lesson learned are, are easily abstracted to any domain you are working on and then I'm going to cover the um, standard life cycle the different steps and what you need to be aware of so i will also try to give you warnings so why i think lesson learn and do and don'ts in different scenario so let's try to define what a standard is i think very generically and i think everybody will agree it's just a convention for doing something established by a community or an authority that can be anything can be a process can be delivering a service so the concept of a standard is pretty broad Obviously, we are interested in what are called interoperability standards. But before I give you a definition of that, and because you are engineers, you will appreciate that the first standard developer was an engineer, was actually a mechanical engineer called William Seller, an American guy. He is the guy that uh, finally standardized the nuts and the bolts. So then now you can buy nuts and bolts from whatever manufacturer you want, you will know they will fit each other because they are standard measure. That wasn't the case before 1864, where you had to buy nuts and bolts from the same manufacturer to make sure that they will fit. Seems a trivial thing, but isn't. And it took him 100 years to get the standard worldwide approved. So that also shows how actually long is a process of defining standards. Obviously, we are interested in standards which are for digital information. We don't care about the nuts and bolts, or we care about the nuts and bolts of the digital environment. And so we want to make sure that we can plug together data, we can exchange data, we can aggregate data, we can make data interoperable and compare them. And when I say data, I mean data set as well as code, algorithm, workflow, whatever. Anything you have, you want to be able to compare and integrate. And so those are operational process that a machine does, a computer does. And for that, we need the standards. And in this case, when we say standard, we mean a specification, a guideline, a criteria, which then gets implemented to enable a certain process. Uh, you know, and uh, when we talk about processes in this case, and because it's a digital processes, we need to make sure that this uh, automation, this operation can be run by a machine, not by human. And, and obviously all of this resonates with the FAIR principle where data need to be able to be uh, read and understood by machine as well as by human. This has already been touched yesterday, but it's important to repeat because these are the type of interoperability standards that uh, community have developed, they are still developing. There are different types. 
there are the, I'll start from the right hand side, there are the identifiers. So these are obviously schema, identifier schema, to unambiguously um, um, identify obviously uh, an element, an object, uh, and, and, and there are many of those, but they're not as many as the rest of these other standards, which tend to be for the metadata. And those are the guidelines, the terminology, and the format. And these three type of interoperability standard sometimes are referred also to to as reporting standard or content standard because they're essential to describe software, a data set, a workflow, and making sure it can be shared and can be understood by a third party. So the three types are guideline, terminology, and format. The guidelines tend to be, uh, they are also called checklist or minimal information reporting requirements, and usually tend to be a list of um, descriptors that uh, everybody has to report so that the same core information can be shared and therefore it's easy to integrate the a data set, for example. Terminology encompass control vocabulary, thesaurus, ontology. I'll touch on these later too, but I refer generically as terminology because they have different semantic richness and different structure. And these are important because we need to use the same words and mean the same thing, which again, it's not necessarily obvious. Uh, format, uh, here again, I'm broadly covering conceptual model, schema, exchange format, and it's about representing information so that can be read and understood by machine. And sometimes formats use terminology as well, and sometimes they don't. Is everybody still there? It's, uh, it's so quiet, and I sometimes I assume my line has dropped and I'm talking on my own. No. We're all here. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a check is needed. Okay, so interoperability standards. So these are the type, what, what they're for. Again, we are talking about making data readable by machine. So they serve to make sure that a system, a software, a database or something can utilize the data independently from the human or at least with minimal human intervention. That's the idea. So the standards, so first and foremost, when I present this to researcher, I tell them, well, this is something you need to be aware, but you are not gonna necessarily have to put your hands into a standard and manipulate things. Because the idea is, standards are this invisible machine that need to be implemented by technical experts, by in tools, in registering, cataloging, database and services. And note, I'm, talking, I'm saying implemented by, not developed by, because I will show that during the development process, you need to have the researcher involved. So that's a different thing. Here I'm talking about once the standard is ready, need to be implemented by tool, and the tool need to make the standard invisible to the lay user. So that the lay user focus on the science and the software and the standard to the heavy lifting and, and, and the interoperability and underneath. So do it on. So, also, a lot of people think that creating just a specification, getting together and then publishing it, it's job done. That's not. It's only when you have implemented the standard in the tool, in a database, and people are using it, and data is being annotated with that standard, that's where you can say, okay, that is a standard, it's working, and it's doing something. And again, that's important because a lot of people initiate the process and then they stop for many reasons because it's not an easy process and it's a long one, something I also will bring up during the presentation. Okay, so now let's move into looking what are the type of community and organization that are developing standard out there and why there are so many and what their focus is and what you need to be aware of most, most importantly. Um, Okay, so um, on the right hand side, you will see examples, mostly in the life science, but there is one from um, uh, astronomy, but there are many more obviously. So on the right, there are examples of what I call grassroots organization. On the left hand side, you find example of more formal standard organization, okay? The difference is the grassroots develop what it's called, they are known as de facto standards. So, which means they get together, they develop the standard, they have a reason for doing it, they implement, and then becomes a standard in that area, in that domain, because it's been used. For a formal standard organization, 
when the standard is done, which means the document is completed, the, the formal process is done, and they have become standard de jure, so they are really formal standards. The difference in terms of community is also very important, and you need to be aware of it. On the grassroots community, they are very much bottom up. So the community get together because in a certain area, let's say in astronomy, they need to share data. There are many research labs, there are different file formats, there are different, you know, richness of metadata, and they want to share the same thing using the same format, using the same terminology. So they get together, the people that need these get together, and the people tend to be researcher with the developer or database maintainer. They get together and they're very much focused on the research. They want to solve the research problem. They are usually they tend to be open to any Anybody who is interested in joining. The, the members tend to be also the end user of that standards. The process you will see that they use is very much flexible, is very much adaptable because it's not formal. And uh, the standard output, they are free for all. It's a volunteer effort. Very rarely you have people funded to do so. There are many minimal funds. Conversely, the formal authority, they are very much industry driven. That's what the industry need. A certain manufacturing process, a certain process need to be standardized across industry. So they're led by industry need. Participation is very much regulated. I'll show you an example later on. It's not like you can jump in and be part of it, not always. Not always the member of this standard organization are the end user. A lot of people are almost professional committee member in these standard groups. It doesn't mean that they don't have the expertise, but nevertheless, uh, the, for, the process very formal can be very lamb, long. Uh, most, in most cases, the standards are sold or they're licensed. And the way that they support themselves, these organizations, is because they offer training uh, for a charge, for a fee. It is a very congested space when you want to start it and you need to decide where you start, but there are, there are reasons why there are so many standards. It's because the type of folks and perspective that the group tend to have really vary. And this, this is especially true for the grassroots organization. A lot of groups come, for example, from a domain of study, from astronomy. Other group comes because they want to bring together imaging technology regarding the type of study. So again, different groups, they get together for different reasons. The motivation why this uh, standard group are creating is very different. different. Sometimes they, they need to create a standard which doesn't exist. Sometimes they are trying to map things standard between themselves. Sometimes they're creating extension of an existing standard. Similarly, the stakeholder groups are different, but usually you always find people which are doing research in the management or they are involved in the research life cycle in any of the stages. You see people from academia to industry to government because you need all the stakeholder type. You see funders too quite often, although it depends. And you also see both the producer and the consumer of the standard, sorry, the word consumer, the user of the standard, because you will see you need this variety of participation. I want to give you an example of uh, why it's not necessarily easy to, to participate in a formal standard. I sit also on an ISO committee, which is part of the Biotechnology uh, Technical Committee. This committee has several working groups. I am part of one of these working group as an expert from the UK. To even be, get there, I had to be nominated through other experts. Uh, to the uh, authority in the UK, which is the BSI, and then become part of this working group. And the way we work, the way that you submit the comments, the way that the feedback is given is very regulated through forms, to a website, during specific time. It's, it's, it is very different from the participation of grassroots organization, which I was accustomed with. Nevertheless, has a, as, an, as a reason for what is exist, but you need to be aware, it's a very different style. Let's also now look at the uh, more examples and more lessons learned, you know, especially for, like I say, my personal experience of working in a, with, with several groups. So first of all, if you are to choose on, under which umbrella you want to start developing a standard, you, your community wants to get together, you need to choose between a grassroots or a formal uh, organization where you then have to present a case and etc. You have to be aware of 
both scenario and both complexity. And, uh, and, and it's important that you also understand how fast you want to go, what you want to achieve, what type of standard you want to develop and etc. But it's also true that you don't necessarily, necessarily have to choose between one or the other. There are groups which have created to use both the EUR and the FACTO standard quite successfully. Let me give you this example, and this is one very close to home because this is an activity that my team stand, started many years ago, as you can see in 2003. We wanted uh, to, at the time, a team was based at European Bioinformatics Institute. We wanted to develop a format and a set of tools, obviously, afterwards, that could describe the experimental metadata for any type of biomedical experiment be able to describe the study, the sample, the assay, etc. Use also other standards that existed and wrap it up in one single format for submission to different repository at DBI at the time. Now, don't get lost in the detail of the slide because I don't necessarily want you to know the bits and pieces. This is just a story you need to absorb and, and the lesson learned. It was a long process. We start in 2003, and as you can see, this table here starts from 2007 because we had to do a lot of legwork, legwork which I'll explain you later in other slides, in terms of defining the scope, defining what I call competency question, defining the community, then years took to create the group, the critical mass, and then we initiated this activity to develop this format, which is called ISATAP, just for your information. We started to develop series of community involvement, a workshop, core development. You need to have a core group that does the legwork and the community that you engage with then give you the feedback from time to time. And then at some stage throughout this process was quite successful. We started developing the tool bits and pieces. We have started to have adopters, people that started to implement and test work. But halfway through in 2012, we were approached by a group who said, we want to extend your standard. It was not even a standard. Nevertheless, was being used. This group from the NIH, from the Cancer Institute, they wanted to extend it for nanotechnology purpose. We say, great, you take the work, fork it, and then do what you want, and as you want, and we keep in contact. So we continue, this is just so that we continue also to publish the work throughout because we wanted and needed to have the visibility of the work we were doing. At the time, biosharing, fair sharing didn't exist. And by the way, the reason why we launched it was a exactly for this project because I needed to understand what the other standards were out there and track them to understand which one we could use for our project. This is how biosharing started simple selfish need and then became something everybody wanted and needed just as a parenthesis anyway let's not forget that i was talking about a group who wanted to extend the standard so that group came to us and say okay we want to extend they they did a great job they took the specification they make it an extension so they added more descriptor for the nanotechnology application they went through a formal, pro they published it, etc. But then they decide to make the proper standard and they decide to target, I don't know why they choose that organization, there are so many. They decide to choose the, e, the ASTM, International Organization that uh, developed standard. They create a group under there. They got the ISATAB NAN to become a formal standard, so a EURES standard, which as you can see now, you can buy for the specification for their price. Nevertheless, they publish in an open journal in, uh, in uh, BMC at the time. And then we also, they acknowledge our contribution. We wrote together a piece for nature uh, bio uh, nanotechnology at the time. So you can see potentially you can do this, these two things at the same time. It takes time and effort. At the same time, the ISA community went on and we are still working on this because the thing is, another lesson learned, which I'll mention later, Developing a standard is not like you have done and then you move on. That remains with you forever. It's not something you, you leave it because if it's been used, there is something called maintenance, which doesn't have an end date. So be aware of that. And we will talk about this later too. So the, the, the ISA community is still booming, it's still happening. And now people are using the format, are modifying it, are 
doing building other tools and etc and it's still open and it's still being used not only in the life sciences we got now even the nasa gene lab actually who are using it as standing for their purpose and at some stage you even lose track on who is using it which is great because it becomes part in the community but you still have some responsibility to bring it forward Right. So again, you don't create your own standards. Uh, well, don't create your standard just thinking that your problem is unique and it's always different from somebody else's special because I have seen many people thinking that their problem was special when they actually could, could have joined other group, reusing it and maybe fork it and etc. I'm not saying that's easy. It's also very difficult to jump in an existing project and, and fork it and make it extension. It's not trivial for many reasons. And I also will mention these later, but it is worth. It is worth because then you maintain compatibility and you have and your standard and the data notated with the standard will have some interoperability with the standard you are using and you are forking. Um, the other reason why reusing or extending is important, and this is something I've said over and over, but trust me, happens very rarely for many reasons, is because there are already way too many standards out there, and many of them should be interoperable, but are not. Again, the reason sometimes I do justify the community when they think that restarting something new is simpler and faster, because sometimes it is, especially if they're not funded, uh, so this picture trying to explain the fact in the life sciences at least that a lot of community uh, have come in developing standard from the biological viewpoint so so from the they they, they were working neuroscience they were sort of solving some problems so they were looking at neuroscience as a field of study regardless the type of technology using neuroscience use imaging you might use even genomics technology you can use anything you know if you study neuroscience because depending on your what you are studying what exactly your experiment is for but there were a lot of other groups that were coming from the technology viewpoint they were saying oh no we are gonna harmonize all the technology using proteomics regardless the fact that proteomics can be used in plant or neuroscience and that obviously led to some overlap or duplication of effort between certain area also because if you see the bottom part of this um, uh, graph you will see that there are technology that are used in different domains and those technology are the same so for example mass spectrometry ms it's used in both proteomics and metabolomics but I have to say there, in some cases, the community has realized that and the community have decided to work together. And there is a good example between actually the proteomic standard community and the metabolomic standard community, which have a lot of technology in common. They have come around and they're working to harmonize and reuse each other standard. So it's a good thing, but it's timely and it's consuming. And I think we have to avoid this um, unnecessary fragmentation duplication of the standard because like i said ultimately the standard need to be uh, implemented in tool and database and we all try to make the same operation share integrate compare data if we also have to start mapping standards and mapping terminology and and make alignment it's additional work that a tool need to have and so a lot of tools have this converter mapping so i mean again it's just more work um, so avoid as much as fragmentation as possible. Sometimes it's inevitable, and therefore you need to, to create converter tool, mapping tool, better than nothing. So um, again, here we talk about commitment and understanding that this is not something that lasts one day, one week, or one month, or one year. It, it's a long journey. And it's a journey that if you start, you shouldn't start alone. So, and you need to have a critical mass and uh, that is able to support the work because a lot of people will go in and out of this group as the time passes, as you get focused on other things. And so it is important to, to have multiple parties which are able to uh, work as a core and as a driver of this effort. One more example, a busy slide, but don't worry about the slide. This could give the, the, the gist of the, the fact that success is fantastic 
but it means more work for you. So more successful you will be, the standard will be more work will be for you to uh, maintain the community, maintain the work. This is an example of a project that actually Alison uh, Alice, uh, Alice and myself and other people in the team have been involved for many years, since 2006, that's a long time. So this is simply ontology that to describe different experimental, biomedical experimental component and to make all this machine readable. The class, the, now that the, the ontology is it's, it's bigger, the, the coverage is bigger, the use cases have, been grow, have, have grown as more people have joined in. And we talk about annotating data in a database, design smart form for uh, simplifying the data submission to enable obviously to drive query in databases because if you have the same term, the same representation, everything, it's easier. But it's, 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 it's grown in terms of community and we have never had any funds in common. So we were a group of people really motivated to do the work in Europe and in US mainly. So be aware of this. Now, before I move to the standard life cycle, which is on the chunk of the presentation, it's quite long, but it's the end of it. it take, still will take a little bit of time. Do you have any questions so far? Susanna, yes. there was a question in the chat window. Go ahead. Um, no, go ahead and read it for me, please. I yeah, I'm just uh, looking to find it. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, how would you fork a standard which you need to pay for and build on top and would there be issues in usage due to licensed material yeah that's a very good question so i don't even know if you can fork a, a, a one of these uh, license standard because like you say you need to see what the licenses is so that's exactly why i'm always telling you to think about where you start the standard some people have indeed started a standard an open standard as a grassroots because the the standard they were interested in were done by standard organization and they were all available through license and etc plus they were not as flexible and as machine readable as they wanted i'm not going to name and shame things here but but this is the true problem so you are, are are most likely to be able to extend an open standard done by grassroots organization than one that is done by formal organization Okay, thanks, Susanna. There's a, another message uh, question uh, from Santosh. How, how does nesting standards within new ones work? For example, if creating a guideline for a new area, um, but it actually has dependencies in other areas, how yeah. would you go about importing those pre-existing standards? So this is great. And if you are working within the same organization, that's slightly simpler. A very good example is the proteomic standard organization, PSI, which I gave the link yesterday. So if somebody can send the link to the PSI uh, collection info sharing, you will see also by going to the PSI homepage, uh, the, the standard, which is a grassroots organization, that they are organizing working group and those working group and those standards are indeed nested. So they have like an overarching standard uh, that describe the experimental step and then they have these um, branches for uh, chromatography, branch for mass spectrometry, branch for, you know, and all the other technology and they are nested because they all depend on an overarching uh, eye level standards in terms of uh, the script or checklist, the terminology and format. I think this um, more complex structure of standard that fit together. Honestly, I have only seen working if you are working under the same umbrella where you design the standard and then um, uh, uh, make piecemeal of the standard and make them as a puzzle. I hope this answered your question, but again, any, any specific on any detail, we can always go at any later stage. Thanks, Susanna. There's no more questions as far as I can tell in the Zoom chat, but I guess this could be an opportunity if anyone wants to unmute their mic to ask a question directly. Yes. Um, I, have a, I have a question if that's possible, but... Um, hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for, for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, I, I would probably drag you out of your, the, the standard, um, but it's something that is kind of like triggering my head. It seems to me that um, reaching and standardization is a standardization is a milestone, it's really important, but there is good data and there is, good, there is bad data. And the process of selecting what should be standardized and what should not be standardized cannot be left to neither standardization 
or some kind of automatization, automatization of the process. So at some point, the researchers needs to be kind of like in charge of that selection, right? And if that's the case, then we have a number of problems, particularly related to ethics. But um, so I'm not really sure that I have a question. It's more like, is, is, is this picture that I'm portraying right now right? So before the standardization, we still will have to have humans involved in the selection of the data. We cannot really standardize everything, can we? Oh, totally agree with you. And actually, I hopefully will be able to answer some of your points in the next part of the slide when I talk about the life cycle, because the first part of the life cycle, it's defining what the problem is. And that is where the researcher are key. That's exactly my point. I actually think you are giving me the opportunity, if there are no questions, to actually go to the next part of my slide. Yeah, that was, that was the UQ. Yes. Any more questions? You still have the opportunity to ask them later. You don't need to ask them now. Okay, hearing none, I'll move on. Uh, so let's talk about the development of the standard. How do you start a standard? Why do you start a standard? What are the things you need to be aware of when you start one? So, like I said, if you are decide to work under this formal organization, the process uh, and sometimes uh, the, the scope of the standard, it's already been decided within the organization because there is a lobby, because the member of the organization say, we need this standard for this manufacturing process or whatever. And then the experts get together to help uh, in developing the standard. And these are just screenshots from the ISO website as well as from the IEEE website, which obviously is an standard organization. We they, they already have defined very strict formal process, a life cycle document timeline. So everything is very much controlled. And I'm not going to talk about those because there is no way you want to change them. If you are part of it, you just follow the process. What I will talk about more, it's in that, is that it's the process that grassroots organizations uh, uh, follow. And again, this is not standardized, but this is a summary that I have seen in many groups by working with them or actually even by, by bring them in, in for sharing, we, you know, we realize that there is a commonality on what they do. And hopefully this will you an, uh, also answer your, your question for the formulation phase. So there are three phases, formulation, development, maintenance. Let's look at the formulation phase. So the formulation phase is the key one. So it's why you are even developing the standard. Like you are saying, and you will see in one of my warning, standards are not de developed because an ontologist or a modeler say, oh, we need a representation for this information. But they are developed because there is a scientific problem that they should be streamlined or there is an operational process like integrating data. They need to be streamlined to enable science, to enable you know, faster science, uh, more use of the data and so on and so forth. And, and this is important and it's not as generic as this. I'm going to introduce later the concept of competency question and you will see what I mean. So first of all, you need to know what the problem you are addressing, which in most cases for interoperability standard, it's obviously I want to be able to share data in this domain, let's say neuroscience, astronomy, whatever, faster, simpler, so we share the same information, we are able to integrate, we can do better query, and so on and so forth. And this is the typical problem all the grassroots organizations have. Then you need to have specific use cases. So specific use cases which then goes is what are the type of question you cannot ask now that you want to be able to ask later if the data was standardized and better integrated or what are the processes which are slower now and you want to make faster or more you know reliable or so on and so forth. Um, prioritization it's also important because most time you have, you bring the group of people together. People have always a lot of problems, cannot share, cannot integrate, cannot do, can do that. And the question is, if you try to address everything, you are never going to progress. So it's very important that you prioritize what you want to do first. In most cases, this standardization group have first and foremost decide to do a minimal information checklist. They said, okay, if we were to share data, what are the minimal information that we all want to share? All the descriptor, all the metadata, 
what are the type of value we want for the metadata, which one of them need to be controlled by vocabulary, which one or not, what the question we want to ask that we cannot ask now, and so on and so forth. And then later have progressively tackled the development of a, a format, a model, a format with different serialization in different languages and 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 sometimes they even have developed a, a formal technology to enhance the the semantic richness of the data it's also important that you get all the expertise you need at beginning and the commitment of these experts and you need people which are knowledgeable in knowledge representation because you will have to do technical thing, you need the developer. So you need the developer which are behind the software or the databases that you are interested in making interoperable. Because if those people are not involved and you are going to deliver something for them to do, you are not going to get their buy-in. But first and foremost, as you can see, I mentioned the researcher because without them, they are ultimately the user of this tool which enable data sharing. Without them, without them telling you what they cannot do now that they want to do better later, you are going to develop a standard which is just technically fantastic but useless to the researcher. And that's not what you want. So the researcher are at the core, front and center of this. And you need to get them involved from the beginning. And actually, they are the one that they will tell you that they have a problem. And with them, you create the group. Genetically, you need more stakeholders than that. So I have seen firsthand that successful groups, successful grassroots organizations have bought in from the beginning, uh, also vendors, manufacturer, you know, especially like say the PSI, the NSI, so metabolites, proteomic community, they immediately went to Brooker, Waters, they immediately went to the vendors of the machine they had because obviously the proprietary format they were using wasn't very helpful. And so, and they, and they have successfully managed to get them to implement also some open standard. Because obviously, if you have a critical mass, if you have a large database, which is also involved, the vendors has a benefit of implementing the open standard because they know that even their customers, they will be interested in having data interoperability. So you really have to play in this sense to bring this community from the beginning. You need to bring the research infrastructure, which are very relevant to your domain. So the bigger research infrastructure, bring them in or work with them, or hopefully they will have the same needs that you do. You need the industry, you need the commercial sector, like I mentioned, but you also need the publisher. Publishers are becoming, have become way more active in the area. And like the proteomic standard community, they worked closely in their case with many proteomics journal, even with Nature Biotechnology Technology Journal, which, which in our field has been well known to, develop, to publish a lot of standard. When the publisher follows the progress with you, he sees the buying of the community, you have better chance than to be able to publish uh, the article in the journal that suits your community, that suits your audience. And sometimes bring the funder in as well. And many funders are interested in facilitate that. That can be potentially, I don't want to say it will facilitate you to get money because it never happens, but certainly you will be known to the funder for driving a community that has a real need. So before you move to the next phase, which is the phase of development, okay, you need to, again, this is, I repeat the same thing, check again that the needs you are defining, the scope you are defining, it's truly unique. And, and there is nobody else working in your area you should join forces with. Now, the advice I give you, that if you were to identify somebody who actually has a standard in the area, don't go there empty-handed, so to speak, and say, oh, I want to join in because I have this need. I think it's not a bad idea to do the formulation phase to um, uh, clearly explain uh, your need, uh, your added value, what you bring, your requirement, before you go to an existing community and say, I have, I want to join and I want to stand it. I think it's good that you explain the extra value you bring, but also the extra requirement you have. Right. With this, I'm going to make now a... a, 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 a I'm going to insert between this life cycle the concept of competency question, which is going to last few slides, and then I'll go back to the next phase of development, uh, oh, sorry, on the next phase of the life cycle, which is development, okay? So bear with me. I'll remind you later where we are. So 
competence questions are essential. And, and Johan, this is again what you mentioned earlier. Competency questions are something you need the researcher to work you with. Actually, they are the one who will tell you what they need. And this information will inform you on what type of standard and how you develop a standard. So competency questions are questions which are collected by surveying interviewing researcher and tell you what the standard must be competent to answer, okay? And also competence question will help you decide what is in scope and what's not in scope for your standard, or maybe it will be scope later on. An example, what you see there are competency questions that we collected during one of our projects uh, obviously, it's life science and biomedical again, by interviewing the researcher and say, okay, tell me you have data in different from in different sources, obviously the, we know what the problem is, but tell me what is the type, the priority questions we want to ask so that you will start, I'll start, you know, defining a, a smaller area to work on. And obviously the list of questions is endless. You have to start uh, classifying the questions by type, by depth, by complexity. So here is just a snapshot. And if we take the first one, one of the, of the question where I want to search all the different sources for organism type, organism type, but I'm only interested in to, um, retrieving a data set that work on apoptosis, which is a biological process at a certain scale uh, with a certain reliability of the annotation, obviously. Some things are difficult to tackle, but it's, we said, okay, some of, of these questions are in scope. We can certainly harmonize the data according to organism type, according to biological process, not sure about reliability, it's, it's a concept very hard to represent. And anyway, so on, we had a list of questions, we decide what's the scope, what not the scope, and etc. And by working with the researcher, you also um, manage the expectation of what you will develop. You will say, look, I will be able to create a model, a format, that you will be able to do this query, but not this other query, at least not now, but at least you will be able to filter by organism, by process, and so on and so forth. So the questions are essential, the competency question. Will also help you not to over-engineer these standards. I have seen models which are huge, like hundreds of thousands of classes, a lot of relations, so complex. And the knowledge, uh, the, the, the knowledge engineer were so proud about this technical monster, but you know, after a few iterations, they had to completely redo and scale it down 10 times to make it effective, usable, you know, and realistic to implement. Because unfortunately, sometimes it's easy to get carried away, especially the technologies get carried away about making something beautiful and perfect. But yet, don't forget that these are not just specification. These need to be implemented by databases. And databases or software will have to retrofit existing data at some stage to the new standards, fill the gaps. So you have to be realistic if you want to get adoption of what people can or cannot do. So it's better a less complex standard, which perhaps address 80%, the famous 820 rules. But <laughs> to be honest, even if you address 60%, it, you are, you know, it's, it's way better uh, than nothing. Then try to make something perfect. You will have more chance of adoption from the databases or the software whoever has to implement the standard and definitely the researcher will be able to, to run 10 extra query that they couldn't do earlier but i think this is called success in my view and in the view of many other groups that have done this work okay i want to go a little bit deeper into the competency questions and how they really help in building a standard okay and again remember i'm still in between explaining you the life cycle this is the development phase uh, so, uh, sorry, this is between the, the formulation and the development phase. So, I want to go and present very briefly the, the term for skill, which is a, a development of a terminology. I won't call it standard yet because we have not done yet, but we are developing, hopefully, will become a standards in defining terms, uh, terminology that helps to um, describe the skills and the knowledge which are necessary to make data fair. And I've used this example because it's domain agnostic and it's closer to home, especially because Alison, Peter are involved, but also um, uh, Yang Wang is involved from the TU Delft. And, and sorry if I've, somebody on the line is involved and I forgot to mention you. Um, so 
what this terminology, so as you can see, there are many groups involved and we also potentially receive funds from EOSC to do this because we didn't have any funds so far. Um, and so this terminology, it's supposed to be implemented where? Implemented into registry of training material so that you can retrieve the training material according to the skill and the knowledge you need to build. Uh, can be also using to design a curriculum for a data stewardship uh, so that you know you have the same skill and terminology reflected there. It can be used also for uh, in training purpose to identify gaps as well as even defining job description for example. Okay so these are the use cases we had. Now the problem we had is that at the beginning people say let's build an ontology and we say wait we don't know if we need an ontology. Why? Again, this is about formulating the problem and understanding the competency question. So people think that an ontology, it's, if it's not an ontology, it's not good enough or you know, it's not the standard. It's not true. Um, just in case you're not familiar with, um, I always say the terminology covered control vocabulary, taxonomy, thesaurus, and ontology. If you see them there, simply explained, I hope, that it shows you that the control vocabulary is just a list of terms with a definition. A taxonomy, it's a list put in a certain uh, hierarchical tree with parent child. A thesaurus uh, tend to have, it's a kind of taxonomy where you start having relationship between the terms. And the ontology is a richer terminology where you have more relationship between the different terms. Now, the question is, you shouldn't jump and say, oh, I need an ontology, because you don't know what you need until you ask the researcher, you ask the user the competency question, and you understand if you really need the richness of the ontology with all the relation, or it, a taxonomy, it's more than enough for you. Right, and that's why we went out, in this case, not to the researcher, but to the user of this terminology, which are more, like I said earlier, maintainer of registry <coughs> data stewards that recruit other data stewards or, or trainers and etc. So those were our researcher, our end user. We work with them to define the competency questions. So why the competency, how that do the competency question then translate into help me build in the terminology and this is what I'm showing you in a couple of slides. So we, I will show you one competency question because it's simpler rather than show you many and I'll show you how from that competency question we understood the type of term we need to add into the, this terminology and if and which type of relation we needed. One competency question was taken from the use cases of I need to search training material. And that was find me guidance on how to select a trustworthy repository for plant sign. Right? What we did, uh, Peter and I, this was during the first workshop of Term for Fair, explained the process. We said, okay, if you look at this question, there are component, element, concept, metadata, call them how you want. Uh, like guidance, repository, data, which are objects. <coughs> they are objects. So guidance can be training material. Uh, so those are type of digital objects and similar type will be data, workflow, method. Say, so, okay, we have binned the first terms into one class, which can be digital objects. Then you look at the question and you see the word trustworthy. Trustworthy is not a digital object class. What trustworthy is, is a quality. It tells you the quality of this repository. Another quality could be open, persistent. Let's say, oh, find me an open standard, find me in a training material which is open or identifiers which are persistent, whatever. These terms, these concepts are quality. Then tell us that in our terminology, we need to have a class for quality terms. Then we look at the question and we say, oh, plant science. What is plant science? Plant science is a type of discipline. And we say, hold on, we don't want to add type of discipline in our terminology. This is when you define the scope and you define what other terminology that exists you will use. In this case, in fair sharing, we have a discipline ontology. Then we say to the group, you are, we are not going to build a list of disciplines in here. We are going to use an ontology that exists, an ontology, a terminology that exists, which is the one, for example, the fair sharing has, and we import 
those disciplines into our terminology. And there are processes to do import and etc. I'm not going to go into this detail, but to let you know. Then the last term we look at was select. So select, obviously, it's a type of process like Kimberly publish or assess. And we say, okay, so what this exercise uh, uh, showed us that, and you have to repeat this exercise, in this case, for all the competency question you get, and narrow them down, or at least the competency question you think they are in scope for your work. Then you, what, what the competency question have given you, have given you the high level classes that this terminology need to contain, and gives you hints on the type of relation that you need to build between the classes to be able then to automatize this type of uh, questions if this terminology, let's say, were implemented in a registry of tool material, okay? Uh, sorry, in a registry of uh, training material. So they are very important. I think, hopefully, I demonstrated the importance of them into the development process and into the well, actually, common question I use into both the formulation and in the development process because help you to define what is scope and what is not, help you to evaluate and iterate and validate the standard you build during the development process. And, uh, and if you work in computer science, you, you know what competency question is because it's very much an accepted test in software development. Let me go back to the life cycle. To finish the, the last two parts. So the second part uh, of the, the life cycle is development and then there is maintenance. So development. Development is when the work starts. Let's say you decide you have to do within your group because you don't, there is nothing you can extend to a group that you need to join and perhaps you then find something you can reuse like let's say another ontology to bring your ontology or terminology but at least you have done your due diligence you are ready to start. Before you start, you need to really think about governance. It seems trivial, seems logistic, but it's essential. Like I said, especially in a volunteer activity, with no legal bounding, with no funds, you need to find, you need to motivate people. And in order to motivate people and reward people, which is another problem I mentioned later, you need to create roles with task, with leadership, advisory role depending on the availability of the people on the willingness of the people and the expertise of the people and balance those some groups some grassroots organization have created legal entity as well because they allow them to try to apply for funds or uh, have a membership or run a meeting and the money was going to the bank to help some of the development so you know, there are different ways that people have tried to sustain themselves, even if they're not formal organization. Of they create a society, and like I say, run annual meeting, getting more people to participate. Some people have just decided to be a working group, and that's it. Defining code of conduct is essential. We are human, and when you bring people with different ideas together, particularly if you bring the expert, people with strong mind, with strong view, you have explosive meetings. Potentially. So, you know, it's important to have a code of conduct. It's important to think ahead of running iteration tests and feedback constantly throughout the work. And that's why you need the groups and people that do tasks. So you share the work and not, it's not one person doing everything. Also because you can't have one person view in a group. It's important. You have immediately to create a web presence. Obviously, now you are first sharing. You can register even if you are in development to be seen and to be found. But obviously, you still have to have your home page. You know, tag it, make it visible, uh, connect to a society that is important in your area. And some working group, for example, have started as working group within a science society and they've created a working group working on the standards so they have the visibility they have the events that they can tag along and etc i think it's important as is important obviously is to this is a development process technical to have like a github project to track the work to have uh, a place where people can contribute code can submit requests and so on and so forth multiple communication channel again people forget that you need to communicate at different level there are people with different interests there and they don't necessarily want to know the nitty-gritty so understanding your um, stakeholder is different and you have to keep the momentum so that's why the core driver are essential we timeline a virtual event not just because there is covid but you need virtual event regardless and keep looking for funding opportunity 
the maintenance phase you have also to bear in mind all the development part but maintenance phase it's where you need to have this lighthouse implementation you need to have the exemplar the showcase the work done so you need to have lined up at least a couple of groups that can quickly implement and showcase the work because it's when people get excited oh i can do that oh, i want to join in so that's really important as well as it's important the technical documentation for having people to um, really have and see things in action like some of you requested to have the example of the standard into the version record that's great the thing is not many people create enough documentation and have them on their website for our curator to go and retrieve it but i think we need to start asking for this information more actively and again uh, you need to create uh, educational material and etc and i understand that the maintenance phase it's very time consuming especially if you have not been able to raise any funds to run, during the development phase metric of use you need to understand who is using your standards you need again address the sustainability issue because if it's successful people are using you are not gonna you cannot switch it off you have to keep it alive usually you have to keep it stable for a while so that other people implement it but signs go fast user want a more request a new technology come in a new data type come in Standards are, are rarely static, they are dynamic. You will have to evolve it if you want to maintain it somehow. And if you're successful, people will come to you to say, can I stand, can I join? You need to be ready for that process. And, and again, the focus is showcase the result, use the competency question to showcase what you can do now that you couldn't do earlier. The success of this this is my last slide, I believe. The success of this grassroots really depends on, on the ability to you to go through all the phases. And like I said uh, yesterday, this is 50% technical and 50% is social engineering. And reward incentive, as well as deliver something that's fit for purpose. Remember the 80-20 rules, it's the best way to really succeed. The final slide, instead of having thank you everybody, is to say that sometimes I think about this grassroots organization um, as a kitchen where you don't have one cook, but you have 20 cooks. Can you imagine that? It's a nightmare, but it's fun because if you're able to achieve something, that will be Michelin-style food. Thank you. <laughs>